Grande sapo, olha. Eu sou de um que está muito This is, I just read this to you. This balloon launch took place in Antarctica and it's an 8,000 fucking pound telescope satellite. There goes the mountains in the background. Here's a visual description of what I just read in that document. On a taxiway and getting it aloft and launching it. Watch what happens. If you like apples, how you like them fucking apples? That's 8,000 fucking pounds, people. 8,000 pounds. That dome on the top, that dome on the top is actually where all of the radio equipment is installed so that the C-130, so that a C-130 can communicate with it. Close your eyes. And in your head, picture the internet. Not your favorite app or website, but what you think the internet itself looks like. Got a good picture of it? Okay, now open your eyes. Ta-da! The internet. So maybe you're thinking, that's not the internet. The internet is like my Wi-Fi router, huge data center somewhere, numbers spinning through a tube. Hey, I'm Nat. And I'm Lo. And we go behind the scenes at Google learning about all the stuff we're curious about. As you can see, we're on a boat. Why are we on a boat, you ask? Well, a little backstory. 
Over the summer, we met Dan and Lincoln from this YouTube channel, What's Inside. They cut stuff in half, and for a while, they've been trying to get their hands on an underwater internet cable. Well, we thought we might be able to help them out with that. We eventually tracked down Vijay, a fiber optics engineer at Google that helps create these cable networks, and we also got extremely lucky. Only a few hours away from our office in New York, one of the companies Google and Vijay work with, TE Subcom, was about to start laying down a new cable system called Monet. Even though there's already about 250 active undersea internet cables that connect major cities and large data centers all over the world, every year we share more information than ever before. So Monet, which will stretch from Florida to Brazil, will add an important new connection between North and South America. And four companies, Antel, Algar, Angola Cables, and Google partnered to create it. So of course we booked it up there and met John and Chris and Jeff who showed us around for the day and we finally got to get our hands on some up close underwater internet cable. <laughs> so very close to shore, it looks like this. All right, pause. Didn't you think these cables were gonna be huge? Like tree trunk huge? I mean, we did. But it turns out, like a lot of things, it's what's inside that counts. And what's inside these cables are extremely tiny strands of glass. Each fiber is approximately the size of a strand of hair. The fiber has to be of exquisitely high quality glass, so no impurities whatsoever. These immaculate little strands, these are the internet. And Vijay told us the way they work is by transmitting your photos, videos, web pages as pulses of light. All these modern cables can carry 100 terabits of traffic. So just to put that in perspective, that's like transmitting this video that you're watching 10 million times. This is the beginning of where a cable is made. So you can see before you a number of bobbins of fiber. The fibers are coated in colors and organized in pairs because they're bi-directional. So for example, a blue might be sending traffic west and a red sending traffic east. And John told us there could be anywhere from a couple pairs to a dozen pairs in one cable. But typically, each company like Google will just get a single pair. So everything after this that you're going to see is really to protect the fibers. First, there's a small plastic tube that goes over them, and they stuff it with gel to keep the fibers in place. Then, small steel wires are put around that for strength. Copper is then wrapped around all of that to seal everything in. The copper also helps power repeaters, these large bulges in the tube every 50 miles or so, which amplify the light across the thousands and thousands of miles that these cables stretch. After that, everything's covered in a plastic tube, which looks like this. This is the insulator to protect the copper as voltage is applied to it. So now this cable from here out is basically ready to go in very deep water. But where the cable needs to be stronger, like closer to shore or in areas where there's a lot of fishing, they'll add one or two more layers of galvanized steel with this crazy machine. And then for the last step, a spindle of nylon threads covers the cable, and then it's coated in tar. Once it's assembled in the factory, it starts its life on a reel, it'll go to a pan, goes into a tank building. Are these all full right now? Uh, most of them are, not all of them. We need, that one's empty. <laughs> <laughs> that it's one's really full. Cool. So when a ship is being loaded, how many pans would it take to fill it up? I would have to estimate around 100 pans. Whoa! From the tank building, the cable makes its way onto the ship down the aptly named Cable Highway. Then it drops down into the ship's hull where it's coiled in gigantic reels. It takes about a month to load up the ship to leave port with everybody working around the clock in 12-hour shifts. When the ship finishes loading, then it'll sail down to where it's going to start the project, which is in Boca Raton, Florida. The ship will get as close as it possibly can to the shore. Then they'll float cable right up to the beach. Usually, the cable is buried near the shore so it doesn't get in the way of surfers and swimmers. And a remote-operated plow is dragged behind the ship to bury the cable. We want to get that cable embedded in the seabed. If it's a very soft, gooey seabed, we need to bury really deep. If it's something that's fairly hard, just a little bit of burial will get you enough protection. The path the cable takes is surveyed out ahead of time so it can run along flat stretches of the ocean floor as much as possible, as well as avoid things like coral reefs, shipwrecks, as well as other bigger challenges. Across the Atlantic, for example, you cross the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. That's an underwater mountain range. So we have to engineer the cable to avoid the steep slope, and then we have to change the armor to ensure that it doesn't abrade over its life while it's laying over that, that rough terrain. So it's like you're actually laying a cable like across a mountain, up a mountain. Across yeah, if you can envision like a blimp flying over the country, then we're laying the cable from the blimp. 
To install the Monet cable, there were actually two ships. The first ship started in Brazil and installed the cable up and around, while the second ship, the one that we visited, set sail south from Florida. And then it picked up the cable the other ship had laid and fused it together with the one it was installing to form one long cable. And in case you're wondering, picking a cable off the ocean floor and fusing it together with another chunk of cable is exactly what happens if a cable is damaged, say from an anchor or a hungry shark. Just kidding about that shark part, it is true that they do occasionally bite them, but they don't really damage them when they do. It's pretty crazy to see the months of work that go into laying just one of these cables. And it's thanks to that work that we have this physical connection between continents, which allows us to see videos and news and photos from anywhere in the world almost instantaneously. And then to realize this is not some new technology. The first transatlantic telegraph cable was actually laid more than 150 years ago, and it looks almost identical to today's cables. The only thing that's really different is the fibers inside. The whole idea of putting something as fragile as glass into a cable that has to be pulled and put under pressure that will crush a heavy steel cylinder and then have it transmit the amount of data it can is really kind of mind-blowing when you think about it.